Okay, I think uh, so. Uh, let's begin with several like uh, questions. I mean, common questions. Uh, uh, one of the issues actually that uh, this morning you have seen the like uh, new semiconductor, you know, chip design and that kind of stuff. But then when you look at that, uh, when I was in like I mean, you know, you know, like high school, basically we are talking of like a two two fifty six kilobyte. But you know in Now we are talking about the gigabyte, right? So there is a huge change in the, like, I mean, the integration of that kind of, like, I mean, the, you know, the chip density-wise is humongous changes. But you know, when you look at the energy density of the lithium-ion batteries, you know, the actually early 1990s, you know, lithium-ion batteries started. But when you look at the energy density improvement for the last, you know, 20 years, actually only maybe twice, You know, something like that. So in the, why there are so big gaps of the, the, I mean, uh, compared to the semiconductor chips and the battery performance? Why, why you, you two think you know, there is a huge difference in the, you know, like a technology development to speed, you know? So, um, yeah, I think I can yeah, go first. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting uh, similar questions quite often from a uh, field in uh, that uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, basically, the... The limitation of the materials uh, makes a such limited uh, progress in the past uh, two decades. Um, for the uh, chip industry, uh, by developing a better processing technology, we can go um, deeper and deeper into a narrower, narrower uh, dimensions using the same material. Mm -hmm. But uh, for a battery part, so you need to, we need to find uh, um, the new materials. And basically, uh, the, the simplest way to find a new material is just go, going through the periodic table. Then uh, as um, um, the, all the speakers uh, described uh, uh, throughout the talks, and, uh, in order to meet the all the conditions as uh, battery electrode materials, um, there is only a limited number of materials left. And such a material pool challenge is uh, basically the main limitation in uh, increasing the energy density in the past decades. So could okay. you, Professor Kang, could you yes. add up a little um, bit? So um, the very brief answer to that question is that uh, we cannot compare uh, the physical scale with the chemical scale. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm not an expert of the semiconductor, but as far as I understand, um, The, the density, uh, I mean the performance of the semiconductor can be doubled if you reduce the length or if you reduce the dimension. And you keep reducing the dimensions and then you're going to have a little bit of kind of moves like uh, kind of relations. But for the battery chemistry, you cannot make the particle smaller or you cannot reduce the dimension of the, your material to double the performance. So those chemical skills or the development of chemistry is a step function. So once you have uh, new chemistry, then there will be jump. And then once you have those known chemistry, then now you have a little bit of optimizations, uh, you have uh, electrode formula, kind of other kind of, those optimizations are a little bit of physical scale, and then you're going to have a marginal increase. But of course, those increase is not going to be as large or dramatic as that of the semiconductor experiences. So we have to wait until the new battery chemistry or the new material, battery material, uh, come up. Okay, thank you. So actually, the, I mean, you know, when you talk about the lithium batteries, so you know, the first thing we remind you is basically in the back of your cell phone or like the um, back of your notebook computer, right? But nowadays, uh, one of the biggest applications of lithium battery is uh, electric vehicles, right? So in terms of that, there is a, one of the biggest issues should be safety issues. So, you know, the, actually, the, the, the battery back of your cell phone, you know, you know explodes. Probably it doesn't g o n n a kill you, right? But when it comes to the electric vehicles, right? So, you know, the, when the battery explodes in the electric vehicles, that's, you know, g o n n a be disasters, right? It's g o n n a kill a lot, a lot of people, right? So in terms of the, the, with that, 
actually safety, especially for the electric vehicle application, going to be critical issues. So you know, the, with that, I mean, what what's going on in the I mean, as far because you are too expert in the battery research areas, you know, it's basically, you know, what's going on so far? What is the best like I mean, the you know, way of you know keeping the safety of these batteries and the, what going to be the future, especially like, I mean, simultaneous, I just mentioned the previous question, you know, the increasing the energy density, but still keeping the, like, I mean, the, you know, the, you know, good safety for this kind of, you know, electric vehicle application. What do you think, to think about that? Okay. So, uh, the higher the energy density, the m higher the risk is going to be, okay? Uh, and we know that Nuclear power has a, one of the biggest energy density, but its failure is going to lead to the disastrous results. Lithium-ion battery has a lower energy density than nuclear, and such that they have a little bit of lower risk of that. Uh, and another fact that we have to keep in mind in the lithium-ion battery chemistry is that we are playing with metastability of the material, which means that with the charging and discharging, the materials undergo unstable states. So it is like art. It's not like a semiconductor which has uh, the, all the stable materials like a functioning and transporting electron. It is the chemistry that allows a large amount of lithium ions coming in and coming out. So we rely on the metastability of the chemistry or our materials. So intrinsically, it is not safe. But there are multiple levels of the safety, device, safety kind of uh, uh, the tools. So the number one is materials level. We have to design the material, even though we, uh, on, we kind of take advantage of this metastability, we have to find out the material which undergoes less metastability. And also, which, goes, which exhibit less heat or less disastrous result. And the second level is a cell level. Even though we have the safe material, and how those materials components are assembled in the cell will make very big difference I with respect to safety. So in the cell configurations, by having anode cathode configuration in realistic or the more optimized one, the cell itself, you mean the 1816 cells or like an AAA type of cell, those cell level uh, kind of safety uh, apparatus can be inserted. And the next level is that when the cells are assembled in a one pack, so the electric vehicle has a lot of cells and it is packed. In the pack level, cell to cell uh, kind of uh, evaluations and how those cells are managed are one of the important. So basically we have a three important and three stages of the safety uh, kind of ensuring apparatus. And then of course we can make each of the steps uh, more important, I mean more kind of uh, optimized. Yeah, Professor Choi, yeah. you want to add up a little yeah, bit more? Yeah. I think uh, uh, basically same answer. I mean, we're trying to find the other chemistries. I mean, as um, speakers already introduced, uh, basically here, the, I mean, the current system catches fire because of the use of a flammable the organic uh, uh, electrolyte. So people are trying to avoid this organic electrolyte by replacing with um, those, those, uh, solid state materials or uh, water-based material. But once we change uh, the materials, then uh, other main uh, the properties not as good as uh, uh, the current really advanced lithium-ion batteries, then uh, there's a trade-off is uh, issue um, again. But uh, once we uh, uh, have a better understanding with a better uh, uh, materials and systems, then uh, these other parameters also could be ca caught up uh, in a certain, I mean, some uh, future. And then uh, we might have uh, we might be in a, in a much better position in dealing with all these parameters at a time. Seems and like I mean, the, yeah. And if uh, I add a little bit, uh, yeah, please. More, um, the managing uh, the safety uh, in batteries is very challenging. Uh, like a, the the quality control uh, in every manufacturer uh, is important. Uh, but the tricky part of the lithium battery or battery is that if we have one single defect, part per million, then one out of million cells is going to make the trouble. And one ppm level of quality control is not sufficient at all. Yeah. So you have to go to 
PPB or more, wow. one part. That's uh, quite challenging. Yes, because challenging. you have uh, you have more than billion, billions of cells. It's going to come up in the electric vehicles. Once you have a U, one single defect cell, then it's going to have a series of the uh, safety kind of uh, incidents. But as I said, uh, those three levels of uh, safety apparatus has to prevent those things. Uh, those are one part. part so you know, basically, could you add a, a little bit like, uh, is there any like a backup plans? You know, is there something like, I mean, the one cell, you know, the, you know, make trouble? I mean, you can actually pinpoint that and uh, just uh, stop that. And then that does not, uh, whatever happening, that does not propagate to the, the other cells and make a, you know, exponential, like, I mean, eventually end up the explosion. So, you know, yeah. can you just stop, just pinpoint that one, the, one, one cell make trouble? We can just uh, stop it. And then, you know, you know, you know, it does not go, you know, the further, you know, the damages. It does not give any further yeah. damage. I mean, that's what... That's what the BMS is supposed to do. I mean, uh -huh. you measure the, the temperature of a, a single point, and if you detect some uh, abnormal behavior, then uh, you try to cut all the, the operation toward the, such a section. So I'm sure that the, the, the batteries, I mean, the putting the electric vehicles now should have that kind of like, I mean, safety feature, right? I'm sure they have that, right? Yes. So yeah. basically, is it, you know, the vehicle, electric vehicle, you know, the, you know, the running around our, like, I mean, the soul, like, I mean, is it, is it safe enough, you say, you think? Uh, yeah, it's, okay. so, so we don't have to worry about it, right? <laughs> so, okay, okay, that's good, at least. You know. So one of the reasons why Tesla was successful in yeah. uh, launching the first kind of a popular electric vehicle was that they had the capability to balance the cell. And then uh, they have uh, like 7,000 or 8,000 cells inside the, uh, the Tesla. And then they kind of uh, cleverly managed one cell defect does not affect the others catastrophic. Uh, those kind of a cell assembly is certainly one of the technologies you have to kind of look for. So I don't know, it's, it's fair to say that uh, as a, I'm, I'm serving as an associate editor general of the American Chemical Society. Seems like, I mean, the semiconductor you know, fabrication process is mostly physics. And, uh, you know, battery is a chemistry. It seems like, I mean, the chemistry is a lot more complicated than the physics, right? That's why, I mean, the, after many, many years of, like, I mean, the extent of research, still, like, a battery, like, a capacity only, like, a twice of the, you know, even after 20 years in the extent of research. And, but, you know, that means, uh, as, a, as a scientist, there is a lot of stuff we have to do, right? And it led to the, that, uh, like, a safety issues. One of the questions I just received from the audience is that uh, when the temperature of battery increases, is that uh, also increase the, the lifetime of the battery? And uh, is there any way you can keep the temperature of battery in a constant so that you can have a longer battery life? That's what the flow asked. Uh, I think, uh, uh, so once again, uh, many uh, electrical vehicles are trying to control temperature because we all know the temperature is a very sensitive parameter to uh, uh, cell operations. Um, usually, if we uh, expose a cell to a high temperature, cycle life um, uh, uh, becomes damaged. I think uh, many of you experience a simple case like uh, you leave uh, your cell phone inside your car during uh, shopping, then uh, after coming back, you realize the battery um, level drops uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, the, the degradation mechanism could be accelerated at a higher temperatures, so that high temperatures are usually not good for the battery uh, cycle life and uh, um, uh, health. So all the chemical reactions uh, mm -hmm. involve heat kind of uh, influx or outflux, and then uh, the batteries, uh, battery chemistry intercalation also involves the heat influx and outflux. And uh, uh, because there are some resistance in the cell, and this also uh, contributes the, uh, the heat. Um, as Professor Che said, uh, once you have the high temperature, then the degradation of the material is going to be accelerated. As I said, the older reactions are based on the metastability. Once you have the higher temperature,
those metastability is going to the ultimate equilibrium state, which is not desirable and is going to lose the capacity. Uh, and those degradation can be one possible problem, but uh, the another more important problem is the safety. Uh, once you have a, some certain temperature above the certain temperature, and those temperature is going to trigger some unexpected uh, reaction, further reaction, which will accelerate the heat generation and it's going to lead to the explosion. So that's why the heat management is important, especially when you're dealing with the large cells on multiple cells. And then of course, this BMS is going to, uh, is going to uh, the play a very important role in uh, the monitoring and managing them. So actually, that, uh, one of the things is actually when I see that the uh, paper by Professor Seed last year in the science paper, you know, the reading, as you have seen this morning, like, uh, like reading millions of uh, papers, you know, the, and then find that the best, like, performing material, selecting performance, you know, the, when I read that, I got really scared because uh, as a professor, what I'm trying to do every day is, you know, that I try to read the recent, you know, the papers in science, nature, and try to, you know, get new research ideas. But you know, it seems like uh, you know the AI can do better, right? Because you know, I cannot. I mean, if I spend like whole, you know, one for one day, I might be able to read like uh, maybe ten papers in Nature Science. But you know, AI can read what millions of papers, right? Millions of publications in just in like, you know just a couple of days, right? So I cannot compete with AI. So you know the. So what do you think about in this sense in general? Like I mean, using you know you know. AI, you know, and they, like, I mean, data mining and that kind of stuff to design new action materials for the battery and also other materials. So is it like, I mean, the, am I going to lose my job as a professor? <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's for the time being. I, um, <laughs> I think that it's just the same uh, conversation as a previous session. I think we can just uh, take advantage of AI to become better professor, I think. Um, like, uh, you can have a better information toward uh, different uh, research directions or um, uh, solving uh, different problems. So that, I mean, um, um, I mean, as a professor, uh, AI could be a, uh, like a threat to a certain level in terms of uh, like, uh, uh, showing some uh, um, showing s uh, some knowledge to uh, uh, students, but uh, uh, just uh, um, having a different uh, stance toward the AI, I think a professor could have a, a better position in doing uh, research and uh, educating people. So I'm really relieved now. <laughs> So I think AI is going to be the one of the is going to become a one of the important tools, but it's not going to take up uh, all the like admissions or our kind of uh, activities away. Uh, but since the AI is going to be the indispensable tools in the research, um, it's going to be the, it's going to matter of the rate how fast those AI is going to AI tool is going to come to the research. Uh, you have to be proactive. I think um, you have to. Uh, learn those new tech, new tools and uh, try to implement those things in your research. I think that's the way we have to uh, be. And I think uh, at least for the next 20, 30 years before I retire, I don't think it's going to, <laughs> the AI is going to take up all uh, the jobs of professors, I think. All right. So, you know, the, let's move on to back to the, like, back to the battery question, you know, the, obviously, like, uh, the batteries we have on the back of our cell phone and also you know, many electric vehicles now actually is use the lithium battery. But the problem is actually the lithium and cobalt and that kind of key uh, ingredient and element in the battery material, battery reactor is actually that the very r rare materials are localized in very specific countries. So, you know, the, a lot of people are talking about actually that the, for the last uh, 10 years or so, there's a, a lot of research ha have been going on, you know, the, on the developing next generation batteries. So, you know, the, what you two think about the, I mean, you know, actually turn out to be for that much like research going on on the next generation batteries. Still, there's no clear cut, you know, this is going to be after, 
you know, the post, you know, the regime and bury. I don't see any of them. So what you to think about that kind of next generation battery, what's going to be next generation? Uh, the chemistry, uh, there were always like arguments in, in our battery community. Uh, is it going to be lithium ion battery, winner takes it all? Mm -hmm. Or uh, it's going to be the, uh, the post lithium ion battery, which will play uh, also the important roles in diversing uh, its end applications. Some of the lithium ion battery is going to be used in certain specific applications, while a little bit more cost effective sodium ion battery is going to serve in this area, or high energy like a magnesium ion battery is going to serve in this apl particular application. So they, these, uh, these are still ongoing debates. Uh, as, as, uh, in, in, as we discussed in the morning session, uh, the silicon, the analogy between silicon technology of a semiconductor uh, with the lithium ion battery technology here is a very proper. Uh, and now it's now start to fight I mean, the post lithium ion battery and lithium ion battery. I think it's going to start, and then we, we will see who's going to be the winner. So, what's going to be the gallium arsenide? You know, the, you know, you know, lithium battery, you know, the, you know, many terms of battery, what's going to be gallium arsenide? You know, uh, you know, a lot of people like uh, said that, uh, you know, gallium arsenide, three, five semiconductor will, you know, take over the silicon. But turn out to be not yet, you know, the only very specific applications, yes, we use gallium arsenide, you know, three, five systems. But, you know, the, in terms of the battery, what's going to be, you know, you know, the, you know, gallium arsenide, you know, versus lithium battery, what's going to be there? I think uh, uh, in such a comparison, I think lithium-ion battery is in a worse position compared to silicon in a silicon technology. It could catch a fire. It has some very, very serious problem and very serious intrinsic problem. That means uh, we could put other competing technology um, at a much better position. So that means um, uh, other chemistries that uh, people speak have spoke about. Um, throughout the day um, could uh, have a certain opportunities uh, once we have a better understanding in the chemistries and a better uh, value chains for um, economic uh, uh, the processing, mm -hmm. etc. If we exclude uh, the discussion of, discussion of the safety, uh, in choosing uh, the the, the proper uh, the battery chemistry, alternative battery chemistry, one of the important criteria is to look up the performance per capita, mm -hmm. uh, energy density or per the dollar. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, well, of course, you want to have the higher performance with the lower cost. Mm -hmm. Intrinsic chemistry tells us that lithium ion battery is not going to be very well positioned. Uh -huh. The sodium ion battery or uh, which sodium is much cheaper than lithium, uh -huh. and the sodium ion battery can take advantage of like a uh, iron or uh, the manganese chemistry, which is much more earth abundant and cheaper than cobalt and nickel. So they are much better positioned in intrinsic chemistry. But in reality, once you have the manufacture and large scale, this lithium ion battery has already has a well lined up lines and a multiple mass scale kind of makes the cost down for the last, last two decades, I mean, dramatically. But now the sodium ion battery, you have to start from the very high price. Oh, okay. right. And even though it's, it has a potential to drop lower than the lithium ion battery can possibly reach, the initial fighting is going to be very challenging. And also, um, there are some applications like a recycle of lithium ion batteries. So right. even though the sodium ion battery are like a cheap batteries uh, are maybe uh, plausible for the larger scale applications which requires much lower energy and uh, much lower cost, there are some recycling technology. So some of the lithium ion battery that have been used in electric vehicles, uh, when they retire, they still have sufficiently high energy density uh, with cycle stability suitable for large-scale energy storage systems. So they can be simply taken from the electric vehicle, which requires much higher criteria in the performance, and then put in there. Then those costs can be lower than sodium or other uh, the low-cost chemistry. So that can be a little bit challenging. But once you have like a very big company, like a, putting a lot of, invest a lot of money in this uh, sodium 
or magnesium chemistry, and then put down this uh, uh, the f uh, manufacturing cost dramatically in a, in a very short time, then there is uh, some possibility to win. So this might be a little bit tricky question, or like uh, can be some of like, uh, uh, might not be directly related to the battery. But, you know, last year, Korean government announced that, uh, I mean, basically, hydrogen economy. So that the essence of the hydrogen economy is basically, I mean, producing hydrogen and then use hydrogen to use for the fuel cell electric vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. So you know, the, in terms of uh, electric vehicles, you know, the, the one we are seeing in the, in, the, in the street is basically you know, battery driven. So another type of electric vehicle is actually basically using the hydrogen fuel cell. So you know, the, by comparing these two types of, uh, you know, you know, there is obvious pro and con for each of these uh, battery-driven electric vehicle and the uh, fuel cell-driven electric vehicle. So you know, the, what by comparing these two types of like electric vehicle, what do you think? I mean, the right now, obviously, you know, pretty much all the vehicle in in the street of Seoul is actually that uh, battery-driven, you know, electric vehicle. But in the future, and also you know the not just Korea, you know, the Japan and Germany and a lot of like, I mean, developed countries you know, try to use the fuel cell vehicles, you know, fuel cell driven electric vehicles, you know. And I don't know, it's proper to say that the electric vehicle, you know, fuel cell driven vehicle is more proper expression. But anyway, you know, what you to think about this kind of like, I mean, the battery driven vehicle versus like, uh, you know, the fuel cell driven vehicles and the future and the current stages, you know, what do you think? Uh, I think I, I got to be very careful about <laughs> this question <laughs> as a battery scientist. That's why I think I, this uh, can be a little bit political <laughs> issue. You know, more you know, so. uh, unbiased uh, uh, answer. Um, I, mean, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, there are good things and bad things for each technology. Um, then uh, for a hydrogen vehicle things, I, we need to uh, take the infrastructure into account. Like uh, how much uh, are we ready uh, for those things? Of course, uh, um, fuel cell has a certain advantage over uh, battery technology. I mean, it could work at a much lower temperature, which is good for uh, winter season. And also energy density is higher, which is better for, I mean, which is good for the uh, driving mileage. But at the same time, we need an infrastructure for, for everybody to uh, use uh, technology. Then um, maybe a good answer might be uh, we better have uh, some balanced view uh, onto uh, both technologies. And uh, we need to identify which application is good for uh, which technologies. I think, uh, for example, for a bus application, maybe uh, for your cell might be doable. But, uh, for small cars and uh, battery technology are uh, very uh, doable. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also infrastructure like um, the hydrogen uh, generation, transport, storage, versus um, like uh, the charging, I mean, number of charging stations per sure. uh, population sure, type sure. of uh, consideration should uh, uh, be taken into account. Yeah. Professor Kang? Yeah, certainly, absolutely, those two uh, technologies are competing technologies, and it may overlap in the end, end applications. Um, I, I totally agree with Professor Che. Uh, uh, in the end, it's going to be the matter of infrastructure. Uh, can you plug in hydrogen at your home? Can you plug in electricity at your home? If you have two different cars, what do you prefer? So, but I, I, but uh, as I said, um, uh, there will be uh, some areas. The fuel cell is going to be more appropriate, and there will be some areas where the electric vehicles, uh, the battery-driven cars, will be more uh, attractive. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of like infrastructure-wise, I think so for the time being, probably like I mean, the battery-driven electric vehicle will be dominate at least you know the in near future right in, in the end you know there's that kind of issues like such as infrastructure of hydrogen station and that kind of stuff is solved and also the simultaneously the fuel cell technology you know is developed probably you know you know maybe 10 or you know you know 
20 years later, we might have to see a lot of like, I mean, the, you know, fuel cell driven vehicles too. Okay, I think this is the time's up, and uh, I think this is, uh, I hope uh, all of you enjoy that, uh, I mean, today's, uh, you know, change to the, for the new studies, you know, the Scientific Innovation Conference. With that, let's thank the two speakers one, one more time, and uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you.